Okay. Can you hear me better now? Excellent. Good. So we will talk a bit today about the singular value decomposition, and we will start very slowly. And we will generally start with um, matrix multiplication and uh, composition of a matrix. OK, so let's consider a matrix A. And in the general form, our matrix will be element of R n times m. And this will mean that we have m lines. Sorry, uh, it will be m times n, m times n. So this means that we have m lines and n columns. OK. So our matrix, we can write as a set of scalar values and some indexing. So what we do is we index the first element here. This is a scalar value and has the index 1, 1. And then we can increase the second index uh, 1, 2, and so on, until we end uh, at the value A1, N. And then in the second uh, row, we can do the same. So we can increase the other index, A21, and increase here. And we will get AM1. Uh, and of course, you can do the same error um, on this diagonal. So this will be 2, 2. And here you will get index AMN. Okay? So this is simply a matrix. And we can actually rewrite uh, this entire matrix into a set uh, of column vectors. So we could also write this matrix uh, a bit shorter, but we write it as a set of vectors. So let's say this is a vector A1, and then we have a vector A2, and we have a lot of more vectors until we end up at the vector An. Okay. So we could also write this matrix like this. So this is fairly easy, right? Everybody of you should know that. Now we can start thinking about um, a matrix multiplication. Yeah? So let's say you have a matrix, and you multiply it with a vector x. What will happen? Well, you can do the math and do the element-wise computation. Or you can actually uh, look into the matrix here. And what will actually happen uh, is that you get a mixing of the two vectors. So what will happen is you will get this vector um, times the vector x. Sorry. Ah, uh, yes. So what we actually want to do is we want to write, uh, OK, we can write them as column vectors. But what we actually want to do is we want to rewrite them as row vectors. Sorry. We want to write them as a set of row vectors, A1. And then uh, we actually put the transpose here. And then we do A2 and do a transpose and A3 and so on until we end up with AM. And then you have your entire vectors essentially uh, as row vectors. So you also need transposes here. OK, so if we do that, uh, you can actually multiply this guy with a vector x. And what you will see now is that if you multiply it with the vector x, you get Our vector is this way. <laughs> because we, we get the weighted sum with x here, right? And what we want to get is essentially a mixture of the So 
we put it this way. So what I want to show you is this guy here. And no indexes here. Okay. Now let's think. Then we need the transposes here. And then we need to sum up. Now if we multiply with the with the vector x, you should be getting this vector here and this vector here. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is going to be a vector again. Oh. OK, forget about this. So what I actually want to do is uh, I want to write this up as a vector x1. Yeah. OK, so what I want to show you is that if we take the other form, then what you get is this is an, this is an x, and we will get indices here. Because what we are actually doing is we are just mixing the column vectors uh, of this matrix with x. Yeah. So what we'll get is a mixture uh, with the components of x. So th these indeed need to be the column vectors. Yeah. And then we have the first column vector. Yeah, that's right. OK, forget about this. <clears throat> Sorry. This was all right. So let's, let's take these are the column vectors, a1, a2, a3, uh, up to an. And now what we can actually show, if we do the multiplication with x here, what we get is essentially uh, the vector a1 mixed with the first index. So this is a scalar value. And we get a2 weighted with uh, x2. Can you even read this anymore? <clears throat> so let's clean the board. So what you get is essentially this vector, a1, and it's weighted with the scalar value xy, where your vector x essentially consists of the component x1 to xm. And then you can rewrite, of course, this will get a vector, and it will be a2 times x2 plus um, a n. times xn. So, this, so you will get a vector out of this, but the vector, uh, vector x essentially does a mixing of your column vectors in the component. Hmm? Yeah, so there's n of those vectors, and um, you also have so this needs to be a vector of dimension n, if you multiply it this way. So it needs to be xn. But every of these vectors have m components. OK? Good. So you can think of this multiplication as a mixing of those vectors, which is a quite um, interesting thought. So essentially, what you get is, in a, in a matrix multiplication, you get a a mixing of the different vectors in the matrix by the components in your vector. And for example, if you know that, um, let's say you have a piece of software and you know it's doing something, something linear, it's a linear system, so it's essentially doing a matrix multiplication, 
and you have a look at the software and let's say um, the person who has been working on the software left a, a big mess and it's really difficult to read all the software. There's no doc documentation whatsoever. But you know that uh, what the software is doing must be linear. Yeah? So it is essentially linear. So for example, this can happen uh, if somebody tries to, uh, to save a list of transformations. So you have some transformations, they're rotations and translations. And if you go to homogeneous coordinates, uh, everything will be, will be just a linear transformation. Now, but the system, what it does, it, it stores all of, these, um, all of these different transformations. So what you can do then is, instead of applying all of the rotation and translations, yeah, let's say you have a, a, a robotic system and uh, several coordinates, and you have a chain of coordinate systems. And these coordinate systems are aligned with the different parts, and then you rotate, and then your coordinate system will go this way. Yeah? So let's say you have something like this, but you know that the uh, transformation from here to here, this is all rigid. It can only be rotations and translations. So what you can do then is, of course, you apply the transform, the rotation, the, tra the translation, rotation, translation, rotation, and so on. But then you have to do a lot of these transforms. But if you know that uh, this is essentially a linear uh, transform, what you can do is you can uh, essentially create this transform by uh, trying to figure out what is the transform that uh, builds this, um, this matrix here. So what, what you can do then is, well, I can pick out a special vector, and let's call this vector 1 and all zeros here. So I plug in a base vector. And if I do that, I will select only the first column of this matrix. Okay? And now if you do that again with a second vector, and you just put a 1 here, and all zeros here, you can select the second uh, column vector of the matrix. So if you do that, um, you can essentially by, uh, let's say this has um, 100 matrix multiplications uh, or 100 of different transforms uh, that are in here, but you have only a five-dimensional space, then you only need five uh, calls of this function, and it will give you the matrix that is computed in this function. So if you have trouble um, understanding what a, a different system is doing, you can actually use the base vectors here to figure out what the linear system is doing and construct this matrix. So one example um, that you could use, for example, is um, you could... So, sorry. So let's say you want to figure out a rotation, 2D rotation matrix. So everybody of you uh, knows, of course, a 2D rotation matrix. So this is a 2 by 2 matrix. But how do we actually construct it? Who memorizes the 2 by 2 rotation matrix? Yes? Yes. Cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, then? Yeah. And, you have the minus sign, yeah, and, and cosine again. Okay. And this is which direction? It's counterclockwise. So this way. So now you can also do this um, by remembering. So you could either just memorize this matrix. Or you, what you can also do is we can use this trick and look at the unit vectors. So our two unit vectors will be 1, 0, and 0, 1, right? So now we do a rotation in this direction. So we go theta here. And then you can think of, so what happens if I rotate by theta this base vector? So I take, this is x1 um, and y0. And this will be projected onto which point? Yes. It's, of course, cosine theta. So 
if you have uh, an angle of zero, this will be one, and sine theta here. And now you can think of the other base vector, which would be one zero, and now you can apply the same rotation, and you end up at this point. And here you see that uh, you'd get a negative x-axis. So the other one will be minus sine theta uh, and cosine theta. Okay. So if you have trouble memorizing this matrix, you can always use this trick just to derive it. Yeah. Because we know this is a linear system, and we can get the column vectors, and there you go. These are exactly the two columns that we just put in here. So you can just use the base vectors, put them in, and uh, get the matrix that is used to mix them. Good. So we can now think about um, what a matrix is actually doing. And there's many ways, of course, how you can think about this. So one way that I found pretty useful is you can also think about uh, a set of points and what a matrix does to it. And a quite useful set of points that you can think about is a set of vectors. And this set of vectors all have the Euclidean length 1. Yeah? So let's say you have one here and one here. This is the unit wall in two dimension. And what you can do now is uh, you can have a look at this unit ball and think about what happens uh, if I apply a matrix A to all of these points. Uh, so this is a set of points. And now I apply A. And then I can see what is happening uh, to this set of points. And what you will see is actually that uh, it will somehow deform your it will somehow deform your circle and you will get a kind of deformed circle with um, some changes in the shape so if you have something that is uh, uh, that ha is not just a, a rotation you will get an, a shape that will probably look like an ellipse so you can generally think about this that um, a matrix uh, multiplied, so in 2D space, to this set of points will cause something to your, uh, will cause something to the shape of this ellipse. And now, the interesting point would be, or is, um, can we actually get those vectors here? Can we get those vectors that give me essentially this and this direction? And can we also compute the uh, the new radius or the two half radius uh, of the ellipse. And this is exactly what we will be doing with SVD. So in SVD, um, we will actually try to locate um, these vectors. So what we actually want to figure out is we want to figure out the component, um, a vector n, that is the longest length. So let's say this is the vector n prime, and n prime is the longest vector in this set here. So what we actually want to find is something that will, so we take, so we take our vector, some vector n here, and then we want to find the vector n prime that gives us the longest length. So what we want to do is we want to take the two norm of a vector n and let's square it. And we want to maximize this. Now the thing is we can uh, for sure find the longest vector here just by increasing n. So this is why it makes sense to restrict us to the unit circle here. So we need uh, also a constraint, and our constraint is going to be that the two norm of n um, should be 1.
Now this is interesting uh, because uh, if we want to embed this into an optimization problem, we can plug the two together and use a Lagrangian <laughs> multiplier in order to embed this constraint. So we can, we can enforce this constraint by using a Lagrange <laughs> multiplier and embedding it into here. So our objective function will then become A times N. And now we need to embed the Lagrangian multiplier uh, with minus the constraint. And we use the lambda as Lagrange multiplier. And uh, we also need this to be 0. So what we do is we take the 2 norm of n uh, minus 1. Now we can further, further, so this will be, this will be our optimization function, L. Let's just call it L of n. And this is the function that we seek to maximize. And this function now uh, will try to find the maximum on here while enforcing the constraint that n should be as close as possible to 1. And now if n gets very high, um, this will cause additional cost in this function. So you can use uh, this kind of Lagrange multiplier to embed additional constraints in your optimization problem. So what do we do? Well, we can first uh, rearrange this a bit, and we can get uh, rid of the norms. So we can rewrite this as uh, n transpose uh, times a transpose a times n. This would be, so this is a two norm. Yeah? So you can actually write this as a, as a scalar product. And we can do the same trick here. And here we will get n transpose n minus 1. OK? So I can rewrite the two norm into n transpose n. And this will give us uh, the, also the two norm. And here we can also uh, rewrite this two norm into uh, the form here. And now we seek to maximize the thing. So what we want to do is we want to compute the partial derivative of ln uh, in the components uh, of n. And we can actually do that and then uh, set it to 0. And you can see that we can actually uh, get, get this fairly easily. Uh, so this is going to be uh, 2 a transpose a times n. So this is quadratic in n, right? And here we get minus and then 2 times n and lambda. 2 times n lambda. And now we seek the optimal point. So we set this to 0. And if we do that, the first thing that comes off is the 2. So we get rid of the 2. And the next thing that we can do is bring this to the other side. So we get A transpose A times N equals to lambda N. OK. Uh, do you recognize this somewhere? What kind of, yes? Yeah, exactly. This is an eigenvalue problem. So what we actually need to do is uh, we need to compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix. And now the cool thing is um, if we use SVD, it will also automatically solve this problem. So this is very useful. So you get automatically the eigenvalues of A transpose A, and uh, to be exact, you also get the eigenvalues um, of uh, A, A transpose. Now, the nice, nice thing is uh, A transpose A is always a symmetric matrix. So A transpose A is always invertible. Hmm? No, it, it's not always invertible. Yeah, it's true. It could be rank deficient, but it's always symmetric. Yeah, yeah, it's true. OK, so. Um, now, the nice thing is um, we can always find something like this and solve this eigenvalue problem. 
And the nice thing as well is that these eigenvalues, uh, these eigenvectors are always perpendicular. So we can actually look at this matrix and then find uh, these directions using this um, eigenvalue problem. And now if we do SVD, we will do a bit more. So what XVD actually does, it will take, so if you'd have, a, and we don't care about the implementation of the SVD right now. So we assume we have some library available that will be able to compute the SVD for us. And if you now do the SVD, what will actually happen is if you put in A, uh, it will compute something that gives you a matrix U, a matrix sigma, and a matrix V transpose. This is what the SVD will do. And you will actually, uh, so the interesting thing now is that, um, <laughs> that the uh, columns, uh, the columns of V are actually the eigenvalues um, of A transpose A. So you can think about this. So U is an awful normal matrix. So this has vectors that are, they, are, they form an awful normal basis. So this is essentially a rotation matrix. And sigma is a diagonal matrix. So sigma only contains elements on the diagonal. So these are the singular values. So this has sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, and so on. So this is... Um, this is going to be a diagonal matrix, and there's only zeros here. Good. And uh, V is, again, a matrix that is an orthonormal matrix, and this is something uh, essentially like a rotation matrix again. So what your SVD does, uh, it, does a, uh, it does a rotation with U, then a scaling, and then another rotation. So you can think about the steps that we have up there. If we, we so we, we decompose A, and if I multiply U times sigma times V transpose, I will get exactly A again. Huh? So this is just a decomposition into multiple matrices. And now if we think of our unit ball, what it will do is, so we apply U here. U is a rotation. It will rotate all the points. So if we do that, to, since we are looking at the unit ball, it's, uh, it doesn't do anything. Because if you rotate a circle, it's going to be a circle again. But what will happen then is the scaling. So we have a scaling on the different components. So this is the effect of U. We don't see it in our unit ball. But now if we apply our sigma, what you will see is that you get a scaling. So this is actually what introduces the ellipse. And you can see, for example, in this case, I'm suppressing this axis, and I'm extending the other axis. This is the effect of the diagonal matrix. This is just a, a compression operation in each of the dimensions. So the, dim the dimensions here are uh, independently uh, scaled. Yeah? So this is the effect of sigma. And now, you put in your V transpose, and V transpose will rotate this back. So what will happen is that you get to the final. So this is what we had previously, right? And this is our uh, N prime, OK? So this has, of course, the same effect as A because it's a decomposition of A. It needs to have the same effect. Now, the nice thing is uh, that we can easily think about uh, what the different effects on a set of points is. And we can understand that this is responsible for the scaling. This is doing a rotation. And uh, this is doing another rotation. And this um, essentially boils down the effect um, of this matrix. So we can also think about, um, so I just, I just claimed uh, that V actually contains the eigenvalues, uh, the eigenvectors of A transpose A. Hmm? Hmm? It are the vectors, yes, it are the vectors. 
sorry, yeah. So you actually get the eigenvalues here. These are the square of the eigenvalues. And it's uh, fairly straightforward to actually see this because now I can do this trick. I can just say, what is A transposed A? Well, I know that uh, we can do the SVD on this guy. And what it will do actually is uh, it will create U sigma and uh, V transpose. And then in the next step, we have to transpose this guy and multiply it with U sigma and we transpose again. So what the transpose will actually flip this. So we will get here we transpose sigma and u transposed. So the transpose will cancel out. And here this stays the same. This is u sigma and we transpose. And now we know these are uh, orthonormal matrices, so this cancels out. This is going to be the identity. So what you get is V and then sigma times sigma times V transpose. Yeah? And this um, really nicely shows you that, um, that V contains the um, eigenvectors of the matrix A transpose A. Yes? Yes, 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 true. What will happen if you transpose a diagonal matrix? That's, um, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Good. So you can actually uh, now see that, and you can do a very similar uh, proof and just plug in uh, A, A transpose. And you will see that uh, A, A transpose, uh, the, the eigenvectors of A, A transpose will be found in U if you do this. Uh, if you do this, you can easily check that. Okay, so why is this useful? So this has a, a really a lot of useful properties. So for example, this allows us to, to do a lot of stuff with this matrix. So for example, what you can do is, let's say you know that the matrix A should be rank deficient. You know it must be rank two. It's a three by three matrix, but it must be rank two. And the nice thing, if you use a, a, um, if you lose a, a library, it will also sort the singular values in this matrix. So you will get the highest singular value here, and then in a descending manner, the other singular values. So let's say, so first of all, we may want to think about what happens. Let's go back to this example. And let's say we have um, a singular, uh, we have two singular values in this example because this is 2D. Okay. And we have the circle here. And uh, let's say we have one of the two singular values is zero. So the smaller one is zero. If you think about that, what will happen is you get u here. So u doesn't do anything because it only, in, the, in our unit ball, it never does something. But as soon as we do this, you will see what will happen. So this is now a rank deficient matrix. So this is composed of uh, sigma 1 and 0 on the diagonal. And what it will do is it will squash down the second component here. So it will splat your circle onto a single line. And now if you actually apply V transpose, what it will do, it will rotate your line back. Yeah. So let's say you get something like this in the end. And here you can easily see what happens if you multiply the unit ball with a rank deficient matrix. You end up in a line. So this is quite useful to think about that. And if you use such a matrix, you get a line here. This also then tells you why this is uh, really difficult to invert. Uh, so imagine you want to project your lines again onto a circle. You wouldn't know how to do that because there's ambiguity. And then you can also think about what happens if your second singular value is really small. Because if it's really small, it will probably look like this or even more narrow. 
And then your ellipse will be really narrow on the second diagonal here. And this can also tell you something about uh, the uh, numerical robustness here. Another thing that's really useful is, let's say you want to invert, you want to compute uh, the pseudo-inverse using SVD. What you can do then is um, you can try to compute A minus 1 of the pseudo-inverse. So let's, let's say you want to compute the pseudo-inverse. And you can now do that in a very similar manner. So you can go here and say, so we have u, sigma, and we transpose. And now you want to compute the pseudo inverse. So it will happen, this will flip again. And then the first thing that you'd have to do is you have to compute v. And then the inverse of, it, uh, of this matrix is going to be just v then you need the pseudo inverse of sigma and you need u transpose. So it's no big deal inverting them, but you will have some problem inverting this matrix. And now you look at this matrix and I can tell you that the pseudo inverse is gonna be uh, sigma one and one over, okay? So you have one over the singular values here. So this is sigma two and so on. And uh, the pseudo inverse, now let's say this is zero. So if it's zero, you will see you can, cannot invert this diagonal matrix. Huh? So what you can do instead is you just, instead of putting infinity, you just put zero. And this will give you the pseudo inverse. Huh? So you're using this trick. Instead of putting, uh, instead of putting um, infinity here, you just put zero because you com can't compute it. And this will give you the pseudo inverse. And now if you look at this, you can immediately figure if you have a very low, if you have a very high, no, sorry, if you have a very low value here, then this number will be very high. So let's say you have a number for a sigma that is uh, um, 1 to the power uh, 10 times to, to the minus 5 or something, and you divide here, you will get a very high number here. And this also tells you that this matrix is going to be very ill-conditioned. Because if you have a change in this component, then a very small change will be amplified a lot here. So this is something that is very close to being um, uh, rank deficient. So if you have very small singular values, in, let's say in floating point numbers, uh, 10 to the minus 7, then you will have uh, a lot of numerical instabilities here. Because this, so it's not necessarily really zero, but it's really close to zero. And if it's really close to zero, um, you get a, a pretty bad numerical stability. So what can we do with this? So one thing uh, that we can figure out using SVD, we can immediately get the rank of a matrix. So you do SVD and you count the number of non-zero elements on the diagonal here, and it gives you a rank. At the same time, you can also define something that is called an epsilon rank. Epsilon rank, and the epsilon rank is, um, is essentially you choose an epsilon and you say anything epsilon smaller than uh, 10 to the power of minus three, you count as zeros. This can give you the epsilon rank. And this is something you often do if you deal with real data. You want to use this epsilon rank in order to figure out where numerical instabilities are. Good, so we can compute the, the rank. We can compute, we can see that we found the eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, of A transpose A and A, tra uh, A, A transpose with the SVD. We found um, that, so one thing that is also nice, um, if you, for example, know that your, rank, uh, your matrix is three by three and you know by theory that it has to be rank deficient, Let's say there's a, there's a skew product in there or something. So you know by theory this matrix has to be rank deficient. Then you can compute the SVD. And you just set the smallest uh, singular value. In this case, if it's 3 by 3, you can just set this guy to 0. And then multiply this matrix again with, um, with u, sigma, and v transpose. And you will get a rank 2 matrix. So you can immediately use this um, to construct 
a rank deficient matrix that is, uh, in an L2 sense, the closest approximation to your original matrix A. And this has been used uh, quite a bit in different computer vision um, algorithms, but also in medical image processing. Okay, so SVD is a really useful tool. Pseudo inverse rank, you can compute null space with it. Um, so the uh, null space uh, can be computed by the uh, column vectors uh, in V. And yeah, so I think this is a pretty useful tool. Do you have any questions so far? Okay, so if you don't have any questions, uh, we can actually go through the, the, so the projector is on, okay. Yes? So wait, which one? Here, this lambda. So let's say let's say your n is is a thousand long. So this two norm of uh, is a thousand, and then you subtract one, and you want to have a high cost associated with a high number of n. You're maximizing this. You're looking for the maximum n. Why? We are, so this is, this is a, a function that we seek to maximize. If I switch the sign, I will get uh, very long vectors. So this is an eigenvalue is is an eigenvalue problem. Yeah. Ah, okay. And now, now, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. This is true. Yeah, yeah. It's in there. Yes. So lambda can't be negative. So yeah, true. So if your your Lagrange multiplier needs to be positive. True. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hmm? Yes. Yeah. No. Anyway. Good. So, um, yeah. More questions? So I think I said everything that I wanted to say. Um, we can still have a look at the set of slides. So as you may have read, so everything I just said uh, is also on the lecture slides. So instead of doing everything on the board, uh, you could also do the easy way uh, and actually look at our uh, slides, and everything should be in here. I think there's a little more, but I think I have the most relevant points. So this is a very powerful method. Um, it's been very, very popular in uh, computer vision, and we will also talk about factorization. So we will also introduce a very cool uh, method in this lecture where we will also use uh, SVD again. And it's extremely robust and simple to use. So what can we do with it? We can do we can compute singular values. We can compute null spaces, pseudo inverse. Uh, we can solve overdetermined linear equations. So I think I didn't show that. We can actually solve a system of overdetermined uh, linear equations. This is also fairly easy. Who wants to see that? Does everybody know how to do it? So let's say this is a, a, a solution for a regression problem. Okay. 
So we need some space. Good. So uh, let's think of a regression problem. So let's think of the problem. You have a set of points. And you have a couple of points, and they look like this. Yeah? So this is your point. And now what you want to do is um, you want to fit a line through here. So what you want to figure out is you want to figure out a line equation. And we will do this very simple. So let's say this is y and this is x. And we choose a very simple model. So we just say y is m times x plus t. OK? And now you, can, you have many of these observations. So I could choose this point and this point and set up my line equation. Or I could choose any two other points. But I want to find is actually the line that fits best um, all of those points. So what I can do now is um, I can rewrite this. And this is a fairly easy trick. So we can say, essentially, we have a lot of those observations. So we can say this is actually yi and xi. And now if we do that, we can rewrite this into a vector. So y will be a vector. And then uh, we can put m and t in here. So these will be our two unknowns. And now I will uh, is, uh, observe all of these um, equations at the same time. So I build a huge measurement matrix. And the measurement matrix has the component x1 to, let's say, it's uh, n points. Uh, and it's going to have the component 1 all over the place up to here. So if I multiply uh, this row with this vector now, you will get uh, m I, uh, mxi plus t. So you will get exactly one of those equations. And it's always the same m, and it's always the same t. And now what we've just learned, uh, this is a system uh, that is overdetermined. Yeah? So you actually um, can't find an inverse, but you can, of course, do a pseudo inverse. So you can just call this guy capital M. And then you say y equals to m times, and now we need to decide for a name for this vector here. What name should we use? B. Excellent. Excellent choice. B. So we will call this vector B. And now you can see that we can get B simply by computing the pseudo inverse and multiplying it to y. And this will get you b. And we've already seen how to compute the pseudo inverse. So this is a very simple regression problem. And you can do that not just uh, with lines, but you can do polynomials and whatnot. Uh, and you, because your problem is linear in the coefficients that you wish to estimate, then uh, you can easily uh, compute the solution with SVD. And SVD will give you the least square optimal solution. So, hmm? so the solution that you get here will be equivalent to minimizing um, the L2 norm of, X, uh, of y minus m times b. If you minimize this, you can also use the pseudo inverse. OK. Good. So this is, this is really cool. So you can easily solve regression problems with this. So you can also think of a polynomial here or something. OK. Good. So we've seen how to compute uh, that we get singular values. We've seen that we get the null space. We've seen uh, how to get the pseudo inverse. We've seen how to solve overdetermined linear equations. We've seen how, oh, we have not seen how to compute uh, condition numbers but we've seen how to enforce a rank criterion. And um, to be honest, uh, all of what you've seen here previously uh, would actually have been on the slide. So it would have, uh, have had a much easier life if we just went through the slides. But I think it just makes more sense developing the math together. 
And sorry for the big mess up in the beginning. Um, it would all have been here. Anyway, good. So this is also the rotation matrix that we've seen. Uh, this is the effect of a matrix on the, uh, on the unit sphere. Then uh, SVD is a normal form of matrices. This is also, you found everything of this uh, is already explained during the lecture. And we have some properties. Uh, something that I forgot to tell you is that you can actually rewrite. This is also interesting. This is also an interesting line here. So we've, we've talked about the rank of the matrix. So that's every singular, the number of singular values that are greater than zero. We talked about the numerical epsilon rank. This is all the uh, singular values that are greater than epsilon. And this is also very interesting. If the rank of your matrix, matrix is R, then what you can actually show is um, that you can just compose your matrix A as the vectors of uh, U and V multiplied with the singular values. Yeah, of course, because all the other entries are zero. But the nice thing if you write it in, in this form here is that due to the autonormality that you have and you just multiply... Um, uh, you, 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 you're creating essentially one matrix here. So if you take U times V transpose, you're creating a matrix, uh, just because of the multiplication. And if you just take two arbitrary vectors and com uh, com uh, multiply them with like this, uh, of course, all of the columns will be dependent. Yeah? Because what you get is um, uh, columns that are all scaled uh, versions of U, depending on the entries of V. So you simply get scaled versions of the same column vector. And that immediately means that this needs to be a rank one matrix. If all of the columns are linear dependent, it must be a rank one matrix. And now the nice thing is that we can actually rewrite A into a set of rank one matrices, and we just sum them up, weight it with the singular values, and then we get a matrix of rank R. So I found this a very cool way of writing down the matrix. So you don't need uh, more matrices than exactly the number of singular values or the rank um, of your matrix and the respective um, rank one matrices. Okay, another thing is uh, if you want to compute the Frobenius norm, you can also sum up the squared uh, singular values. And... Um, yeah, we already seen this observation, and if you square the singular values, you actually get the eigenvalues of the respective uh, problem. Question? No? You, you feel free to ask questions. <laughs> Don't worry. Okay. Good. So this is also an interesting slide, and just just one thing. Um, don't don't go ahead and uh, now memorize everything that you've seen on this slide. Yeah? But just think of SVD that it's really a useful tool. Yeah? And if, you, if SVD is your friend, you can, you can solve problems pretty quickly. Yeah? And, but we will mainly focus on the applications of SVD. Yeah? So don't memorize all of the properties. Yeah? But it's useful to have them in the back of your mind. Okay, good. So, and I think we have the condition somewhere. Did I jump over the condition? Kernel, null space, example, ill condition, exactly. So you can compute the condition number here uh, denoted as kappa, and the condition number is the L2 norm of A inverse times A. So if you, you will get a very good condition problem if your condition number is small. And if you have an ill condition problem, then you will get a very high condition number. So don't just go ahead and say, okay, the problem is ill-conditioned. If you start saying the problem is ill-conditioned, you actually need to show that it's ill-conditioned. And if you know it's a linear problem, then you can show that it's ill-conditioned. For example, if you try to invert a matrix uh, that has a very, very low uh, epsilon rank. Uh, so if your rank is, uh, if you have a very low singular value in there, you will get a very, uh, very high condition number. 
And if you actually have a zero uh, rank in there, so if you have a zero singular value in there, you will get a singular matrix, uh, which will give you plus infinity as the condition number. And now you can actually check that, uh, that you can compute this condition number really quickly by uh, taking sigma 1 over uh, sigma n. So the smallest singular value and the highest. So you take the highest singular value and divide by the smallest. And this, if you end up with a very high number, then you have an ill-conditioned problem. So what you, if you have a, a condition number that is very close to 1, it's well-conditioned, and you can get a very good uh, inversion of the problem, for example, of the matrix. So here you can see in this particular example, the condition number uh, is something like uh, 118,000. And 118,000 is not a very good condition number. And you can actually show that if you vary B by 0.1%, it implies a change in X. So if you have um, AX equals B, um, then it will imply a change in X by a factor um, of 2.4. Yeah, so you have 240% change. Okay, good. Uh, what else? And I think these are, these are the optimization problems. So here we have uh, enforcing a rank criterion. Um, what is this one? Here we are actually uh, doing the, the trick with the eigenvalue. So we've already seen this. And another thing that we have here uh, is, uh, again, another rank criterion. So if you want to enforce the rank uh, K, the rank of B should be K, then you can get this uh, approximation by the sum up to K. So you skip out um, uh, singular values that you don't need or equivalently would be setting them to zero. So you can also do that. And uh, here, for example, we take an image on the left, uh, compute the SVD, and sang, set its rank to 1. And then you get suddenly column vectors. And these column vectors, they are all linearly dependent, because it's a rank 1 matrix. Uh, so in, uh, from left to right, you only see scaled instances of the same column vector. And here you can see that this is, for example, useful if you want to figure out uh, the position of a collimator. Uh, if you have this very nice alignment, uh, then you can use this trick to figure out where the collimator blades are, for example. It makes perfectly sense that you just have uh, a linear dependent column vector, and these are the just different scales. Good. And last, obse uh, observa uh, last observation is the moore penrose pseudo inverse. Um, what you can also derive the pseudo inverse um, that is um, a transpose a uh, to the minus one times a transpose. Has any has everybody seen how to derive the moore penrose pseudo inverse? It's also fairly, see, fairly easy. Who wants to see it? So if there's four people, four seems to be enough, right? Everybody else were just, were just hesitant. No, it's very easy. Uh, if you want to derive the more uh, Penrose pseudo-inverse, pseudo um, what you're actually looking for is, so you want to have uh, AX equals B, and now you want to um, find the inverse that is actually, uh, you want to solve this for B, right? So what you want to do is, uh, you want to find the matrix A that is, that actually solves this uh, optimization problem. Let me think about it. We want to find, we want to minimize the problem, yeah, the, this problem, AX minus B. So this would be solved by AX minus B to the power of 2. And now we want to minimize this. We want, it, uh, want to set it to 0. And what can we do? Well, we can uh, compute the uh, derivative, the partial derivative with respect to the matrix A. And if you do that, uh, you will end up uh, with 2A transpose 
um, times AX minus B. And now you want to set this to zero. Yeah? This is the partial derivative. The first thing you can do is you can cross out this two. And the next thing is you do is you have A transpose AX minus B uh, equals to zero. So what can you do is um, you can now Yeah, I forgot one A transpose. I forgot the A transpose here. There it is, exactly. So this is the A transpose. And now what we do is um, we want to still solve for X. So what we do is we add A transpose B, and then we get A transpose A times X. And now we can invert this guy because it's symmetric, and we get A transpose A to the minus 1 A transpose B. And this is your pseudo inverse. Yes, that's it. So it's very, just a couple of lines to actually derive the, uh, so we start with the L2 norm, do the gradient uh, with respect to A, and then you get the pseudo inverse just from this. So also fairly easy to show. Good. Um, what else? So we can also, um, Use the diagonal matrix and put one over the squ uh, one over the singular value, and construct it. And this is also uh, yeah, very useful if you want to estimate regression lines. This is now the example that we also did here. Okay, good. Some remarks. Um, we will use SVD as a black box. Yeah? We we won't consider any algorithms to compute SVD. Uh, you guys will be using Python in the exercises, and it's, it's shipped with an SVD. So we have everything for linear algebra, so don't worry. Um, it's very nice because it can be computed for any matrix. It's numerically robust. And the time complexity uh, to decompose, well, given M and N, you can see uh, that it's, uh, it's square in M and in N, and it's power of three in N. So for in most practical situations, we will have M to be larger than N. Uh, so if you think about this matrix, for example, so we will have a, a very powerful tool to decompose the matrix A. Okay, take home message, SVD is the tool for linear equations. Um, it, it will not fail. Uh, there might be better solutions to this. Uh, but it's very useful, and if you start experimenting, playing with it, it's really, really useful. So if you start developing an algorithm, start playing a bit with the data, SVD is really, really useful. It's provided by all the standard libraries, and for us, it's always our first choice. And there is still a remark on the oral exam, uh, but you won't need it anymore. <laughs> Good, and here's a couple of further readings. Any more questions? Other than a lecture at four o'clock in the afternoon is really late. Good, if you don't have any questions anymore, then we can conclude today's lecture.